Welcome to Show Studio. It's London Fashion Week and we're actually kind of getting towards the end of London Fashion Week now. It's all gone by in, in a whirl. Um, but it's a really exciting day. It's that day where sort of it seems like every single show is packed into a sort of an eight hour slot. So it's very busy. So I can't thank my wonderful panel enough for taking time out of their schedule um, to come here. But of course you'd want to come here because we're gonna be talking about Roxanne Ilinchik, who's such a star on the schedule and also such a lovely, wonderful woman as well. So it's gonna be a really, really nice occasion to talk about her her collection. But before we begin, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, starting with you, Julia. <laughs> I'm Princess Julia. That's all you need to um, say, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Who do, I, who do I look at? The camera. <laughs> okay. I'm Caroline Burstein. I'm a creative director at, at Browns in South Moulton Street, Browns. I'm Marion Hume. I'm the international fashion editor of the Australian Financial Review. I'm Richard Mortimer. I'm the editor of Pony Step magazine. Now, before we went live, we were having this really nice discussion about sort of what point everyone started going to the shows and you're having this wonderful discussion about sort of going to see you know Galliano's first show and I want to start by talking about how London Fashion Week has changed and what we see the identity of London Fashion Week now as opposed to sort of in that mid 80s period what's the biggest thing you've noticed Marion? That's a big question. Oh that's a big question. <laughs> that's, Sorry. that's 26, is it 26 years? We were having the discussion that the three of us in the middle actually started <laughs> quite early so my first big London Fashion Week memory is basically the one that's become incredibly famous and involves your mother. <laughs> it's the John Galliano show where um, the model, the ludic game where the models were dancing and throwing fish in the air and one of them. It's become such a myth that people don't really remember what happened, but this <laughs> fish did go flying through the air and it landed on Mrs. B's lap. And there was a moment where everyone went, hmm and she just put her head back and roared with laughter. <laughs> but in, a, in very much your mother's way, you know, it was a sort of wryness, <laughs> and it was exactly the right reaction. And of course that stuck in my mind. Mm. And it got him noticed. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> do you think people can do that kind of thing now? It feels like everything, in, in a great way, everything's become slightly more sort of sanitized now, but in a really good way. Throwing know. fish at the most important person in London's probably not a good <laughs> tactic to use twice, frankly. <laughs> but uh, there are other ways of getting attention. Other ways of getting attention. Let's talk about the generation that Rock Sanders from then, because she kind of emerged alongside your Christopher Kane's, your Mario Schwab's, you know, that period where it felt like there was a huge amount of really exciting young designers. What makes that generation so great and what makes Rock Sanders so, so great? There's kind of two questions there. Caroline, what do you love about her? And, and um, I love everything about her. Um, I, I've always loved her style, right from the first time I saw one of her first collections before she even did a catwalk show. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they were these gorgeous just s dresses that were like handkerchief, just put together, but beautifully put together. Mm -hmm. And um, she was such, she's always struck me from the first time I met her as somebody so very sincere about her work, so able about her work, and um, with a, a sense of um, that work ethic that I knew, even with this very simple collection that not everyone could wear. I mean, you had to be as gorgeous as her, really, to be mm. able to carry those initial dresses off. But uh, something resounded in me immediately that this, this that Roxanda had what it takes, and and it's proven. She mm. look where she is today, and I'm very happy for her and extremely proud mm -hmm. for her. She's, oh, she's special. Yeah, yeah, she's special. Richard, have you followed her work for a while? Yeah, um, almost, f yeah, almost from the beginning. Um, and, you know, I completely agree back then. Even you would look at the pieces and they would be really beautiful. They wouldn't necessarily, back in the very early days, be the most amazingly well-finished pieces. Mm. But I think what has always stood out about Roxanda is she's never compromised her vision mm. and it's always been really, really strong. Mm. And I don't know, she, for me, she delivers this sort of modern romanticism. It's, it's, it's very romantic, but equally it's really modern. Really and I think modern. she's one of the few people that, that can pull off that combination. Mm, definitely. What do you like about her work? Um, I agree with you. <laughs> I've got, um, <laughs> Roxanda herself is so stunningly beautiful. Yeah. Um, what I like about her stuff is that when you're wearing one of her dresses or pieces, 
you, you, feel, you automatically feel like you're making an entrance. Yeah. You know, they're, they're very statement making. Definitely. Um, but they're not overpowering because they are quite sort of stripped back and that, that there's a simplicity there. But you know that actually the, the patinage is quite sort of complicated. Mm. And that's very artful, I feel. Yeah, that's you interesting. You know, that's, it, it looks effortless. It is, that's interesting um, with her work, because she, she's not effortless in the sense that she's mm. got all these kind of wonderful references, she often mm. to artists, but then mm. the final product is mm. very kind of streamlined. Yeah, yeah. It's that modern thing that we yeah. were saying. Yeah, uh, it's, it's really clever. I think she's a really, very clever designer. Mm. Um, it just looks very classic mm. and, and uh, sort of modern, but a, a, a really, like you said, a romantic classicism attached to her work. Mm. I think also there's a lot to be said about a woman designing for a woman. Mm. Um, mm. You know, I think she really understands her customer yeah. and, and what her woman wants to wear. Well, it's interesting because the point that she emerged, she was kind of a, a lone female voice amongst all these great young male talents. You know, I mentioned Christopher before mm. and Marius. And do, you, do you guys agree there's something in that, a woman designing for a woman? It's a really big debate, this kind of it's idea. It's definitely different. I mean, f a few days ago in New York, we had Donna Karen's 30th anniversary show, and uh, which I, I loved, actually, mm. I really did. But there's something sort of, it's practical plus romance, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, because of, of actually yeah. being there and selling things that, yeah. that I think, yeah, women want to look, I mean, we all want to look different. You can't make a sweeping statement, but... Mm. There's something about a, f a female designer that you, th you do think differently about yeah. clothes. I think a female designer understands that you want to be comfortable in mm. your clothes. They want to be a part of you and not something that's imposed upon you for a specific, to give a specific look about mm. yourself. I, I think, don't you think? I think that's very... Yeah, but then isn't it funny? There are s the, the designer that I'm thinking is the best at it is actually a man who's Albert at Lonvin. It's one of the yeah, designers really that true. is really the best yes. at kind of the, yes. the he, presenting he, clothes that are about who you are rather than people going, wow, look at that dress. Mm. Yes, it's true. It's very true. But he's rare. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think male designers is too often this idea of a fantasy rather than actual kind of like the day-to-day -day requirements of dressing and what you need in your life? Do you think it's too much about kind of the look rather than... It's really complicated, isn't mm. it? Because actually, you know, your first instinct is to go, yes, women design practice in a practical way about comfort and they design very much for the rest of womankind and then you think of someone like Christophe Lumera Hermes who is absolutely superb at that and then so let's think of a woman designer who actually doesn't design practical clothes there must be several here we are we all go blank no, <laughs> no, 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 some of Vivian Westwood yeah, some of Vivian yeah. are yeah. not um, what you'd go out to tea and you know out yeah. to work in every day she's she's she has a wonderful you know creativity in that way and that she'll Im it's not an imposition you choose you you if you're going to wear those clothes it's, it's because it resounds with something in s within yourself mm. and um but with with Roxanda she's I I also love her the way she uses color yeah in and color and and blocking and and pattern in her clothes. I think that that's, a, I think she does that particularly well. And I think also. that is quite new. I think dresses and colour are such a huge part of, of London Fashion Week now, but I've interviewed Roxanne before and she kind of talks about the fact that when she came out of St. St. Martin's, there weren't actually many people doing dresses in the way that she sort of started doing. And she found that, I'd, and that was a very new idea. Mm. And I think that's really easy to forget how fresh and modern that felt at the time to sort of play with colour, but also play with the dress in the way that she has. And now it's, such an established part of Fashion Week, but she is kind of a quiet revolutionary in that sense. Well, she emerged at an era mm. where it was quite hardcore. Mm. I mean, the others that she came out with, although actually some of them are much softer now than they were, but she was very different from the rest of that group. And yeah, the colour thing is gorgeous. It's mm. a sort of fauvish sense mm. of colour. It's a beautiful sense of colour. Mm. But again, that thing of you can't go on men do something better than women or the other way around because the person that she mirrors is to me is Saint Laurent that, that that wonderful sense of color blocking which is very much what he did mm -hmm. so again it doesn't necessarily come from being female or male or male 
I think we've probably taken that statement a little bit too far. I didn't yeah. really mean it to that yeah. extreme. I felt more that as a, a, a female designer, she really connects with who she's designing yeah. for um, in a way that sometimes I think some of the particularly, particularly the, the gay male designers don't really connect with, you know, God, that's a big a one now. I just I think yeah. when, the way that she designs clothes, I think, you know, she knows the woman and I, I, I think I think it counts for something. Yeah, and it's interesting because Roxanne, because she's very sort of, she's loved within the fashion crowd, but then she's also, she's very removed from it. Essentially, mm. she's a wife, she's a mother. She's got this kind of whole separate life where I think, as you say, she interacts with the woman that she's designing for in a way that perhaps some male designers don't. They're much more kind of in in a fashion life that she's perhaps not. She kind of pulls herself away and she takes a lot of inspiration from her daughter, for example. That's quite a kind of, a real way of, of living and designing. What do you think about it all? I'll studio? say you're down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> With the fashion, in the fashion line. Yeah, well, she definitely has that huge part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she does go, she's quite social. Yeah, completely. Yeah, she, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of good yeah. faith towards oh, her. Oh, she's though, a lovely there? girl. Yeah, she's so beautiful. Yeah. And just really fun. Yeah, yeah she's really, really fun. fun. Does she still drive the Subaru? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking before as well about kind of what's happening with her brand because we were saying she's got a store opening in Mount Street like later in the year. Um, what would we like to see happen for, for her in the future? Do you think she's one of those labels that would be great to see her picked up by an LVMH or get a big set of investment? Or do we like that she's kind of a little independent doing her own thing? I think any London brand that gets picked up by LVMH or any of you know those big companies, I think it's a really positive thing, and mm. I think you know it, it. It just shows that we have got a wealth of talent here. So I, I would love for to see her, you know, mm. get that investment and become a real global player. Because mm. she sells very well internationally. I don't know how, who do you find her shopper is at, at, at Browns. Do you find that it's very varied? Um, yes, it varies. Yes, it varies a lot. Mm. I mean, from you know a, a party girl to a working woman, mm. um, to someone who's got an occasion and, and wants to stand out and wants mm. to, but at the same time, as I've always said, just there's something very wearable and very real and comfortable about her clothes. So mm. you want to stand out, but you don't want to shout out. And mm. I think that's, that's possibly, you know, the subtle the difference. The difference, yeah, actually, that's a really good point, standing out without sort of shouting about mm. it. Yeah, that's interesting. The only thing with the, the big investment, and, and I completely agree with you about LVMH or Caring or you know, any of the, the, the big luxury brands when they turn up with their big wallets and invest, it's, it's generally very good news. But what they're always doing, of course, is they're not giving money just to support a designer. They're building brands and that side demands that the designer branches out into the things that actually make money so so the pressure is to become really an accessories designer uh, you know to do very good accessories and with her maybe there's another way to go i mean it surprises me that she hasn't already got as far as we know that kind of investment mm. so maybe she's kind of plowing an independent path and trying to do her own thing but have we seen it with the designers that have had investment do you think with whether it's christopher kane i guess it's kind of too early to tell with jonathan anderson JW Anderson, but do you do you think you see that kind of shoehorning them into into things that will sell? Um, LVMH is you know they're clever and they're subtle, so it's not going to be that obvious, mm. uh, completely obvious. But we look, when we think of what really sells in fashion, and Browns of course is the great exception because Browns sells clothes. But what what really sells in our business is is often not clothes, mm. and it's the other things around them and. I, I, I love clothes, so I think when we when we start to look at these big investments and we realise that what we are creating is principally handbag businesses, mm. it's actually quite nice when there's mm. somebody that that doesn't seem to be her ambition. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it is, and Mr. Arno just hasn't knocked on her door yet. Well, it's interesting because when she does create bags, they're almost kind of derivative of her clothes, and there's a lot of draping in them, you know. And she's done these wonderful pieces that look like they're inspired by the fashion rather than just kind of tacked on, which I guess that's quite interesting. But yeah, it's. In, it's this idea, I think, though, it's kind of worrying in London sometimes, is that 
to succeed, you have to have an investment, and, you know, that you haven't made it unless someone sort of gives you that cash injection, which I guess is worrying because actually to have a stable independent brand, that's, that's kind of, a, there's a place for that as well. But do you think we, we put too much focus on kind of, yeah, being picked up, that that's what you have to succeed when you're a young designer? It's just what we're focusing on now, isn't mm. it? I mean, if we were having this conversation 20 years ago, when of course this technology didn't exist, but we would be, the, the thing we'd be fascinated by would be, you know, no disrespect for Browns, but what we were obsessed with then was whether the Americans were buying. Mm. We don't talk about that anymore. You know, that yeah. used to be the mark yeah, that's of, how the uh, and, and now the mark is our LVMH, you know, investing so many millions. It's, it's just, we, I guess we have to have something to talk about when we're yeah. sitting waiting for the show <laughs> to start. <laughs> Should we have a look at the show? Should we have a look at what she's done for this season? So we were talking, what's the, we've talked a lot about, you know, how effortless and how great her clothes are, but what would we say the Roxanne sort of DNA is? What do we look to her for? We've talked about dresses, we've talked about colour. What else is it? Volume, I Volume. think. And architecture, I guess, mm -hmm. in a sense, because she yes. comes from an architecture background. Definitely architecture. And I just love the way she places these blocks of colours and abstract shapes, mm -hmm. shapes which are very... You probably know which artist that... Uh, I was hoping you did. No, no, I was hoping you would. <laughs> Richard does. Over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Richard. Uh, I'm out. But, uh, I think one thing that's interesting with what she does that I'd like to talk a bit more about is designers that cater to different age groups because I think London Fashion Week really does fetishise kind of a young shopper and what's cool and what's young and it feels like with Roxanne, she's very smartly not actually thinking about, we're always thinking about a younger woman, which I think sometimes that can get a bit lost, especially with the really young designers who are coming out. It feels like their work would only look great on a kind of cool young 20 something. Do you find that with, I guess in the store, the women that come in that buy, that buy her? Well, her we, work? it's very rare where we have a young 20 something coming in yeah. and buying Roxanne or, or most of our clothes, other than the clothes that are in, Focus. Focus, yeah. Not saying we don't, we do. There's a big international, very, very, when I say it's big, it's actually very small, mm. but a very focused international crowd that are, are young and they do have the money and they have got the fashion education. Um, and I think we're all after, including the designers in their minds, mm. that person, that woman, and there's not that many of them. Mm. And the women who can actually afford these clothes and would wear, and these are so beautiful, mm. that dress and the two-piece and the coat. Um, she is an older woman. I mean, yeah. she is somebody probably mid-30s to her, you know, and, and upwards that would carry that off. It's not even about age, you know, it's about a woman's sense of style. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's what Roxanda has. It's, for me, and I've always personally, my personal sort of gravitated towards designers from my own personal taste that do this, that are not about a fashion moment, but they're actually about a sense of style. And I see her sense of style just moving, evolving slightly, just growing, but it's still very much her and mm. her identity. And she never goes off in one mad direction or, or in another but you can always see this sort of sense of, of who she is, and there are dresses in there that are for someone very young and for mm. someone older as well, which mm. is good news, mm. good news for me. <laughs> <laughs> they're yeah, very, yeah, they're very browns, actually, looking they're at very them and with you here and that. Yeah. I, I actually started my fashion career selling yeah. for Caroline's mother, so <laughs> from the age of 17, <laughs> I worked at Browns, and my my specialty, I think we could say, was luring a certain age of woman into the fitting room <laughs> and selling them so much that Caroline's late father was always a great friend to me, wasn't he? Well, yeah, he liked loved it. you. And I can see, you know, yeah. if I was in Browns now, we would, we could, we'd sell yeah. a lot of that. We would sell it's a beautiful, lot of that. and you can mm. you can see the woman coming into the store excited to try and find something. Mm. The big challenge then is that for that woman to leave still feeling excited that she has found something. And this really serves that, doesn't it? It's mm. Definitely. What's standing Definitely. out to you? Um, there's quite a few jazzy numbers, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I quite like the, those sort of lacy, uh, lacy sort of numbers sort of mixed up with colour. Mm. And this, this, this sort of dress here, I can't really see how 
Is it? Do you think it's a fabric or is yes. it applique or something? It's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. we've got close-ups. Yeah. Yeah. Too yeah, so we can have a look. So um, yeah, that's quite an interesting diversion because, as you said, she's known for her sort of colour blocking. Mm. That's gorgeous yeah, print. Look, that's me, isn't it? Mm. On the end there. Yeah, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> <laughs> How much oh, do you think one of those frocks would be? Mm. Very hard to tell, but I would think you're looking a lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> it's lovely. Yeah. So I can probably borrow it for a photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> You're plotting how to wear Yeah. I love that she does a, she's done a flat shoe as well this season. Yeah. It's great. There's real ease to what she yeah. does as well, which is quite fresh. And like these skirts she's been wearing, are they, they're made out of sort of neoprene or something? Yeah, she's they? very good. Sort of, yes. you know, that, I find that quite interesting as well. That's sort of how she's using that fabric because you yeah. do see that fabric on yeah, actually various silk, there's things. There's actually some of them are silk satin that oh, actually okay. are, um, you know, she merges hard and soft very well, you know, she's got yeah. this very interesting concrete and, it, yeah. and this show was shown it's all kind of scaffolding around it with that wonderful mm. blue tone sort of mm. suspended on the scaffolding. And I think she's really good at merging things that are quite sort of um, minimal and, and hard and almost mm. brutalist, which I guess comes from her architecture background with stuff that's, that feels very colourful and soft. So it never feels kind of cliched, even though it's very feminine, which mm. I think is interesting with her work. And this collection, you get that a lot with. Do you like it, Richard? Um, I do. I don't know if it's my favourite ever collection from Roxander, mm -hmm. um, but some some of the standout pieces I think are brilliant. Like the dresses at the end, mm -hmm. I, I really like that that coloured print, and I really love the patchwork coat. Mm -hmm. um, Technicolor dream coat. Yeah, it's gorgeous, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, it's really amazing. Yeah, I like that she's in a, a blue period. I think that's quite nice. Yeah. She's doing mm -hmm. <laughs> Picasso with that. But I always Although like I'd, I'd never wear the next group, the, the, the brown and the blue, personally, because it, well, it's just not my personality, but yeah. I think it's so beautiful. Yeah. I just think that the, the colours are just so beautiful together. Like, I think this, this, this look sort with of the group, trousers. Yeah, and that dress. Yeah, and, um, yeah that. These are my mm. favourite. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I like that a lot. Lovely. Isn't that rare, though? Because we are quite different as people on this panel in mm. terms of you know, how, how we dress and uh, probably also how we think. And yet we're all sitting there and kind of slightly shopping. We're a bit diverted <laughs> by, by what we might wear. But I think that's the mark of a good collection when you kind of... You can There's something for everyone. Yeah, yeah, exactly, definitely. Also, one thing that I do want to talk about with her, you know, is her work oh, always feels very global. Mm. It always feels like it doesn't feel kind of London in that sense. It feels like, and obviously she's not from London She and she draws her influences from sort of her own personal heritage but this it always feels like it's very worldly what she does and like she's looked at other cultures and looked at other styles and there's always a kind of and it's coming through in this a little bit something kind of folksy about it and, and I mean that as a real compliment do you think that's something that a good London designer has to have which is a kind of global gaze and do we see that more and more now given that the art schools are pulling in people from around all around the world so it's a really big question but there's no mm. such thing as London style anymore that's for sure mm. I don't know if there ever really was, but what it, what is London style now? It's incredibly diverse. Mm. It's incredibly sort of unexpected. It goes from this kind of elegance to something that is delightfully quite rough. So, mm. is that a change? You we were talking at the start about the changes we've noticed over kind of like the last twenty or thirty years. Is that something that you have noticed that London becomes sort of as more and more designers come through, ever increasingly global? And I, I think the designers um, are are ever increasingly global and their work, their, what they show is, ever, from my point of view, is ever increasingly um, sophisticated and slick. Um, whereas I think a London style w was always a bit, back in the 80s or at the beginning, was, was very much the street style or the original street style mm. and um, very experimental but when you turned the garment inside out, it was so badly made, and yeah. the, the <laughs> fabrics were so shoddy, <laughs> and there was just, you know, it was, it was embarrassing. You'd see the things coming down the catwalk and they hadn't been steamed properly. There were all those little details that have been, mm. I think, you know, really polished up with yeah, the, mm. the emphasis and the pressure on growing mm. up and becoming mm. more global. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I went to the London College of Fashion um, MA show. Yeah, and it was I amazing. Really was blown away yeah. by exactly those yeah. things. Like everything really beautifully finished and Absolutely. considered. You know, and e even though it was like they showed 10 designers and they were all very different, they all had that 
thing that I'd really sort of considered mm -hmm. a, a lot of different angles um, and, and, the, and the really turned it out actually. It, yeah. was, it was good. We really said good. that on the panel for it, didn't we? Yeah. That they all felt like they were yeah. considering themselves as sort of real, like actual design. Yeah, that that they were no ready to go. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's it's tough out there. Yeah. There's mm. lots of lots of wannabe designers out there, you know. Yeah. And the ones that are there, they want to stay there, mm. and we want them to stay there. It's very in defence of the eighties. Yeah. I think <laughs> now, now, now the design <laughs> <laughs> designers know so much now, and oh. to to send out oh. a collection that's not perfectly finished, uh, it, now you should. Yeah. And. The 80s was, it, you know, London was a much smaller town and there was, of course, far less information and there was an enormous ex exuberance and fearlessness. Yeah. But what I think has carried on of all of those is the fearlessness and that's mm. wonderful. That's what makes London different from New York, Milan and Paris, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And it, all of those other cities have, you know, great qualities and we love travelling to see fashion there. But where, this is fearless, it's beautiful, yeah. it's immaculate, but it also... It's her saying, "This is this is kind of what I want to present." Mm. And for for mm. all of London, that's maybe true. Do you think? I, I think. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, Marion. It Should is. Guest cameo. From <laughs> 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 Look who it is. Oh, come play. What do you think of Roxanne Ilinchik? <laughs> You'll match ah. her first three dresses. Yeah, look at you, so cute. <laughs> oh, no, I can't get distracted now. Yeah, let's have a look at some of, uh, some of the close-ups to see some of the detailing. Do you think? Do you find that we've been talking about that on a lot of panels actually? And I'm really intrigued to get to get an opinion from someone who works, you know, it works with customers actually buying the pieces. We've all talked about this idea, of, especially yesterday when we had the Mary Catranzi panel, that people are a lot more in tune to sort of craft and they want to to feel that something is has sort of whether it's been touched by hand or feels sort of expensive because of the embroidery or the workmanship on that have you noticed that as a change that consumers are much more savvy to that i think the buyers and the media are much more savvy mm -hmm. i'm not sure at that level whether the consumers are to be honest okay, i don't so think they're they're enough of them really appreciate or or want to know about what's gone into the garment. I'm always a bit sad when I, I know mm. how much work has gone, how much craftsmanship has gone into a piece and and you see them just being tried on and thrown mm. off and not appreciated. And it's all based I on think the look. It's, not based it's on all based on the look, yeah. Oh, that's and the such feel. A shame, so there's still sad. work to do to get it to filter out there, I think. Yeah. Um, because I think if people did appreciate or understand a fraction of what goes what work goes on behind each and every one of these shows there would be you know there'd be a huge yeah, different appreciation yeah what do you think of the flat shoes and mm. socks Richard? Mm. are you a fan of that i am a fan of women in a flat shoe and socks i really it's, yeah. i really like it and it's funny because i've seen a lot of it this fashion week i think mm. the two the two big footwear trends that i've noticed are flat shoes and socks and um knee-high boots mm. I've like seen. Girls want to look easy now, don't they? They want to look cool. I don't think women want to wear kind of a, they don't want to look trussed up in the sense. And I think what this collection does that really well. It's that effortless kind of thrown on thing and like you're rushing about your day. But that's quite how Roxanda dresses. You know, she'll be wearing yeah. some incredible floor length skirt and then she'll just wear it with a t shirt. And yeah. her hair's yeah. kind of. But it helps being over six foot tall. And and beautiful. And she's so like beautiful. Yeah, she's so yeah. beautiful. Yeah. She, is, she is her own muse. <laughs> <laughs> what about the bags? Lovely. What do you think of the bags? I like them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. A sort of clutch. It's. I like the kind thing. of accessories that she does. Actually, that she's playing with that, and it feels very authentic, doesn't it? It doesn't feel like she's kind of putting a bag in. You know, you see that so often mm. where it's like put it with a bag, yeah. and yeah. it's really forced. But what's her point of difference? Because we've all talked about what she does. She has such a clear vision. But what makes her stand out from from other designers on the schedule, and what and what's made her such a sort of unique force in London Fashion Week? She's classy. That's actually such yeah. a good point. <laughs> Do you think that's part of yeah, it? That's just yeah. yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. She's a classy bird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, ne it never feels, although it feels like it's progressive, it never feels like it's trying too hard. Mm. 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 And yes, it's that. It, there's an effortlessness about her, about her, her, her looks that she creates. 
you think it helps when as a designer you design for yourself because we see that occasionally with designers you know it feels that very much that way with Phoebe Philo at Celine and, and even with Stella McCartney and then uh, this goes back I guess a little bit to that sort of female designer versus male designer thing but there are a lot of female designers that don't look like they design clothes for themselves Mary Catranzi is quite mm. a good example you know she tends to wear black but do you think there's something special when you are just completely designing for, for you as, as a as an individual there, there is, but it has a built-in disadvantage, which is that if you design for yourself as a woman and then you're, you're growing up and ageing as a woman, then that can be very difficult for your brand. Yeah. Um, especially when you're much older. I mean, the fact that Karl Lagerfeld doesn't design for himself means that, you know, he is now whatever age Karl officially is mm. and, and can, is still thought of as young because no one sees those clothes as him. Whereas if there were you know, a woman of that mm. same era, it would be harder. Although, of course, the woman who is, is in, in that same era is Vivian, who again, today's all about great exceptions to the rule. I mean, you know, Vivian's um, biological age is 22 or something, and yeah. she designs for, that, for a 22-year-old. But there is that difficulty, I think, as a, that's, really that's for female designers. Um, Yes and no, but as you say, you know, Vivian's done it. I'm trying to think of Catherine Hamnett's never really changed. It's always been her her look mm. from from the beginning. I it's think Stella McCartney will be an interesting one yeah. though, because her look is so closely associated it's very true. first with like this kind of rock chick, then mm. with a rock chick mum. As she grows older that's going to be an interesting journey to observe yeah, that's stylistically. Mm. You must find this is, I keep doing a kind of flashback to the past thing, but you must find that as well, we were talking about kind of the shows when you first started out and the number of amazing brands that are no longer with us and kind of drop off the schedule. Do you always have that? It sounds incredibly pessimistic, but do we always have that in the back of our head? I think especially when we look at London Fashion Week of, but how are these brands gonna gonna survive? That's always a kind of sad thing when you look at London. I have the opposite, because I always think they all have survived and there's some, um, there's a big exhibition coming up at the V&A in April, the Italian Glamour exhibition, mm. and there was a press preview for that. And the, the curator flashed up a picture of Romeo Gigli, and nobody around me knew who he was. And I was like, I was saying, we, <laughs> we, but you must have heard of Romeo Gigli. And, and no one heard. There was these complete blanks, and I was like, oh. Yeah. And I got married yeah. in Romeo Gigli, and I thought yeah. he was I still lived really in Romeo famous. Gigli. <laughs> <laughs> But fashion has a yeah. short memory, doesn't it? It's so interesting when you think of, like, even we were talking about body map before we went live, and I think if you said body map to a lot of the people at Fashion Week now, the young students and stuff, they wouldn't know what body map is. And that's so scary, I think, to think that, you know, whether these brands are going to have longevity. And that's what's nice with Roxanne, is it feels like she's got past that period where you worry about her anymore. Mm. Um, I what? suppose the difference with people like body map is, I, I would say maybe, I mean Richard to correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say they probably still are remembered, but of course they didn't make the money from it. Yeah. And so it's one thing being remembered if you know, everyone is just using you as inspiration, but the, the next era or maybe two generations mm. after uh, yes. will actually own their archive and their history much more maybe. Mm. Where do you stand on it Richard? Do you think that everyone who's around on the schedule is going to have a bright future, or do you think? Because there have been a few articles recently, are we producing too many designers, you know, that kind of thing. Um, no, I don't think they are going to have a bright future. You know, I think there will be, you know, every generation there'll be people that sort of, you know, shine from the beginning, and you just know they're going to be really successful. And I think it happens really quickly. Um, I think people sort of know within you know a couple of years whether or not these people are going to go on and do really great things and I think it's really sad because you know London does produce some amazing things and it, it, it you know it's just circumstance isn't it that you know some people will do really well and some won't but not not everybody can can make it. Mm. How do we ensure that that we are sort of being, I guess, kind to designers in that way and not sort of putting people on a pedestal where they're going to drop off, off the schedule in sort of a few seasons. Is, is it the case that we shouldn't be encouraging so many people to start their own labels? What's the kind of answer to that? Because I think there is somewhat of a conveyor belt feeling to Fashion Week occasionally where it's kind of more talent and the schedule's getting even more packed, but then that's, that needs to mean that people are going to drop off. That's the problem. But what do you do if you don't let people who are talented start a label? 
what what happens to them? Mm. I mean, they go off to, I don't know, Max Mara Group or somewhere and work behind the scenes. Or I mean, maybe that's a very rich profession. But I think if people have a need to express themselves creatively, then they should go for it. Mm. And also, there's a lot to be said for people going out there and doing a label and then realizing actually it's not for me. And I'm really yeah. happy to go and work for, another, for, mm -hmm. for a big company. Yeah. I, I know quite a lot of people that have done that and their lives are just so much happier without mm. the pressure of running their own label. But I think unless you do that and you, you have the have opportunity to do it, mm. um, you know, mm. I, think it's I, I think it's important I that they... Yeah. I, I don't think you can generalise and I think it is, it is how it is. It's, it's like all of nature and all of life, it's forever regenerating, renewing, you know, we see it in, in, the, in, the, in the seasons, just in na nothing stays the same. Everything grows, we all grow up and we all grow older and we all, it all moves on. Mm -hmm. And fashion is, is a real barometer for that. And so very much on the, on the sharp, on the cutting edge or at the sharp edge of, of life, if mm -hmm. you like. So yeah, people are going to fall off and those that hang on have got to have you know, be incredibly strong or have a, a lot of strength around them. And uh, it's, it's a very tough industry. And even those big brands at the top that have huge advertising budgets that are global, that are enormous, that can dominate, um, you know, they have to be, I think, pretty ruthless to actually st stay where they are. Mm. Um, yeah, fashion's not all fun and games, is it? As much as Fashion Week makes it seem... This is the nice bit. Yeah, this is the nice bit. <laughs> this is the nice bit for all of us, but it's, um, it's like any business and any industry, it, it demands everything mm. of, from you. And I think it's interesting, because I, I you must feel this as well at Browns, that the kind of people that come in and buy fashion, they probably, they're not aware of the kind of the financial difficulties of being a young designer. You know, fashion can feel very glamorous when it's actually not really at all. I think there's a lot of... It's funny when you see Fashion Week, and, and especially when you know some of the designers or you've been to their studios and you know that they're not actually living a very glamorous life. They're just, it's very sort of, you can get, it can be very sort of hand to mouth at some points, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a tough industry. I don't think then many, you know, fashion designers have time to lead a, a glamorous life because mm. it's a relentless um, hamster wheel. Mm. Um, the whole cycle of fashion, of actually going from one, creating one collection to the next, there's very little breaks and even less now than there were 20 mm. years ago because they have to do pre as well as mm. all the things that they have to do. So um, they have to be committed to, to their work mm. and um, anyone who isn't is definitely going to fall off. Mm. So it takes no prisoners. <laughs> Yeah. Do you notice that with your friends in fashion, they're not having a very good time? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing to see the struggle that a lot of these young designers have to go mm. through. Mm. Um, yeah, ju just to carve out an existence, just mm. to keep going. Mm. It's, it's relentless. Mm. And it is funny when outsiders look in on the industry and they think it's, you know, Quaffing champagne and <laughs> yeah. parties, and it's really not well, like that. That is part of it. It is, it is. You know. it, it is, but, but it's such a tiny part of it. It's such a tiny part of it. Yeah, but also, you know, if you're really passionate about doing, creating, leading a creative life, I mean, how fabulous that the, even though you've you've put so much energy into it and it might be a struggle, but to actually see it on the catwalk as a piece of fabulous work, a collection, you know, that, that in itself is, that makes it all worthwhile. And then if you, like, you know, like, I've, I've been sort of at places and, and um, talking to a designer and then somebody's walked past in one of their, one of, one of their clothes and they're, they're, you know, it's really an exciting moment to actually see your work off the catwalk and on a person mm -hmm. wearing it in everyday life as well. Mm. So I, I guess it's like anything creative. If you if you see it, sort yeah. of people appreciating it and and you put so much love and passion into what you do, that really makes it all worthwhile. <laughs> but I think appreciation. What 
I think the point is, though, is that appreciation mm. doesn't pay the bills. Well, yeah. yes, I know. And sometimes it's the designers who are the most sort of acclaimed and appreciated where mm. actually they really struggle. Like, mm. we talk quite a lot on these panels about someone like Louise Gray because I miss her so much yeah. and seeing what she does. Mm. But, she, you know, it just didn't work in a commercial sense. And she's she, coming back. Yeah, she's coming back. She's you know, she's back. not dead. But, like, yeah. it's always that hard, that hard thing, isn't it? That often yeah. the ones who get the most, yeah, the most appreciation aren't the ones that manage to... Well, there has to be a fine balance, you know. The clothes have to be wearable for enough mm. people to, who will buy them so that they can sell. Mm -hmm. I think that, and, and I think she gets that uh, completely. Yeah. And, and any of the designers, Christopher Kane, um, you know, all that generation who are where they are today, they all get that. They all make clothes that are wearable for mm. a woman, for many women. Mm. And um, as well as making them look and feel extremely beautiful and special and sex sexy and um, brave. Um, they are, at the end of the day, clothes have got to be wearable. There have got mm. to be enough women that look at them and, and you know, you know, plenty of things between mm. us all that mm. we go, yeah, that's me, mm. all of us here. Mm. And that's, the si that's her success. Mm. Yeah, and that's that what's really going to keep her collection. successful. Mm. Yeah, we all had a different and sort of favorite three looks, but actually mm. that's... Yeah. That's a strength. And I think a lot of the clever designers will do amazing shows, but they'll modify the collection for when they go into yeah. the set, into they the do. showrooms. Mm. And I think that's the really clever designers, and they're the ones that will often succeed. Mm. And the ones that listen to the top buyers will succeed because the buyers are buyers from Browns or from Harvey Nichols, and those buyers also know what they can sell. Yeah. And so if they listen to the cr any criticism as being constructive criticism and take that on board and help them develop their, I'm not talking at this level, she's, um, but generally, that, that also helps them. Is that one of the things you enjoy most about sort of working in an environment like Brown's, is that, is that interaction that you get with the designers and being able I've, to sort of... Um, we all really enjoy that, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's very much part of it and I don't do that much of the buying mm. um, for this part of our business but when I did and what I do do it is that it is that it's um, you're totally inspired by what they do when you're actually close and holding these clothes in, on the rail on the hanger and um, it, it, it's like food it feeds you mm. and I'm sure you're the same when you're able, you know you're able to write so well about when you know, and you could create wonderful images with them. So they're totally inspiring. Mm. And um, and sometimes we'll we'll say, if you could just do this, I think we could sell this more easily. You know, just lower the hem. And and often there'll be things that they'll they even say, don't worry, the hem will be lowered by three inches before you've even <laughs> opened your <laughs> mouth. So they do it. know. <laughs> they do preempt. So what yeah. um, what's next for Roxanne? What would we like? To, how would we like to see her grow and develop? I think she knows where she's going. Mm. I mean, this is this is very directional. Is one of those words that means different things, isn't it? But she knows the direction. It's clear, and the fact that even the set is is exciting, mm. and the, the clothes are beautiful. This is someone with a very very strong arc on where they're headed. So I rather think well, she certainly doesn't need my advice. She may need <laughs> she may need Caroline's yeah, much I, more I, than I mine, she's but she's she's got it worked out. She knows what she's mm. doing. And I think the Mount Street store is such a statement for her. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Let's talk about what that means, because Mount Street, it's kind of the place to go in London to shop in some ways. It's absolutely incredible. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a, big, it's a big statement. Are you looking forward to opening? Yeah. yeah. I hope there's a, a nice party. <laughs> <laughs> and we can all wear this and look great. Yeah. Oh. Me especially. <laughs> Well, I think that's a nice note to end on the thought of Richard rocking some rock sound. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. What a lovely, lovely way to spend a Monday. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.